Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Botswana. Botswana. We'll do geography, gourds, really interesting history, and then we'll flip through this book. And of course, tonight we have Topo the elephant, the ASMR elephant, who has a very um, tingly ear. So let me put him up by the microphone and I'm going to wiggle his ears. Here we go. Here we go. Just to start off the video with some topple ears. Because Botswana is home to the most elephants anywhere. And uh, don't mind this. I have really bad eczema on my hands. I had a bad flare-up. It's actually not that bad. It just really hurts. So I just have a bandage on it. I hope that doesn't diminish your relaxation at all. Just ignore this for the next couple of videos. Don't worry about it. Anyway, Botswana's geography. So Botswana, as you can see, is landlocked here in southern Africa. It's bordered right here by Zimbabwe. It has this big, long... Very important border with South Africa. It has this border with Namibia. And as you can see by here, Mother Nature doesn't make straight lines. So you know that there's a man-made border there. It has that long border by the Caprivi Strip. And it technically also has a tiny little border with Zambia. It has a little bridge connecting the two countries. So they don't touch. There's a river right there but um, technically they border in a way so Botswana's biggest geographic feature by far would be the Kalahari Desert which takes up pretty much all of this area up all through here it's also in Namibia over here but majority in Botswana and the Kalahari Desert is not quite with a desert like how you think of a desert with sand and all that there is that but it actually gets too much rainfall to be considered a desert um but you know it looks like a desert <laughs> quacks like a desert walks like a desert you know it, it basically is a desert but not by definition because it gets a lot of rain uh, but it is still very sandy hot and dry um not very great for farming, but um, there are lots of diamond mines in Botswana, so mining is really the big industry there. Um, as you can see on this part of the country is pretty much where the majority of the big cities are. I would say where the majority of where people live, but this is actually not the majority of the people live. Botswana is very sparsely populated. There are lots of people, but they're all spread out in all different areas around the country. So I would say the, the capital city area, Gaborone and Francistown, the, the cities up here are the most densely populated areas of Botswana, but they're not the most populated areas of Botswana, if that makes sense. Um, the cities here, Gaborone in particular, are very, very highly developed. Very modern city, very like high standard of living. It's, um, you know, it does have its fair share of crime, but pretty much this day and age, every major city does. So it, um, you know, it's a big city. It's not like, um, like other like major capital cities in the more impoverished countries of Africa. Like we just did Guinea Bissau a few days ago, and their capital city is just like a, like, a really elaborate village like it's mostly just like like homes and two-story buildings things like that this one's actually like skyscrapers and paved roads and <laughs> all the things that you would expect in a city in North America or Europe or Asia um, you know the, this this part of Africa this whole corner South Africa and Botswana and, um, you know this whole little corner over here is its own special thing one of my favorite corners of the world. I'm not being picky. I'm, I, I think it's so awesome. 
and I know I see every place is awesome, but um, South Africa and Botswana have like a corner of my heart. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we cover South Africa. I love South Africa. Anyway, moving up. Let me ignore that wire there. Right here you can see a big spot of white, and that is the Magari Gari salt pans. So when it rains, this area floods with water, teeming with wildlife, and once the dry season comes, it dries up and turns into a huge salt pan, cracked earth and all that, and it attracts different forms of wildlife, mostly birds and things like that. But it's a very important wildlife area. But by far the most important wildlife area would be up here in the Okavango Delta. The Okavango River flows out, and once it reaches the Kalahari, it just kind of sinks into the ground and um, turns into a big inland delta, which there aren't many of those in the world. They're very unusual and really neat, I think. So during the rainy season, the river floods. The delta turns into one big, old, like, watery <laughs> delta, basically. And it is just teeming, teeming with wildlife. All kinds of wonderful African animals, mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, all, all the classics. You know, you got the elephants, the lions, the leopards, the rhinos, white and black rhinos. We've got the ostriches. We've got wild dogs and all kinds. Well, I'll have a whole video about the Alcavango Delta for you in two days. Yeah, two days. So you'll learn more about it then, but it's an absolutely beautiful little corner of the world, and you'll see some pictures of it in this book as well. And um, so the borders I was talking about, you can really tell that these are river borders. You can see like the Limpopo River, a very famous river in southern Africa. The Chobe River is up there. Um, <laughs> the oh, anyway, these are all rivers, various ones. Uh, but this, since it's in the desert, and there's not much there, it's just straight lines divided. And I talked about the Caprivi Strip when I covered Namibia. Really interesting little piece of geography there. I talked about it a bit in Zimbabwe too, but anyway. I'm gonna wait. And a big old fart. But usually when I talk about, you know, there's straight lines as a border, which means there's nothing there. That's not quite true for Botswana, because like I said, it's, um, it's, the, the population's all spread out all throughout the country, so even though there's like nothing here, there's still lots and lots of people that live all throughout Botswana, living very traditional lives, lots of different cultures, and we're going to start off our history up in this section up here. Um, it's where the Tsodilo Hills are located, and it is the earliest inhabited part of Botswana. The earliest evidence would have been from about 400,000 years ago, so we're talking very, very early humans. It's also the world's largest concentration of rock art. These people loved to draw art. And there's some pictures in here, too, the really beautiful rock art. It's really, really neat. The majority ethnic group in the, the early history of Botswana would be the San people, who are very tribal, very um, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They still are to this day. They're still there. Um, if I can slide this over a bit without making too much noise, and Tapo moves out the way, you can see a San hunter over here. I think that's as far as I can go before I start making a mess on my desk. There we go. Um, and various Khoisan-speaking tribes also in the area. And then once the Bantu migration occurs up from, like, I have to stop touching that wire, but northwestern Africa moving down, um, sort of pushing the San people out of their territory as they take over and intermingle with the other tribes. And for quite a while, the culture here was... Um, a mixture of hunting and gathering, but the majority would be farming and cattle ranching. Um, the farming cultures were very, very big in this area, and um, the sort of mishmash of different cultures coming in, establishing their own ways of life with cattle and 
how they farmed created the Tswana speaking people. The Tswana group split into many different other groups. The Tswana, you can see right there, Tswana. Um, and what's very important uh, about these groups that I want to say now, uh, mostly because it has to do with their history and it still applies today, this is still around, is that in their tribes they have a leader who is a male that's passed down um, like a like a king basically what's the word I'm looking for um, passed down like father to son and that tribal leader is known as the Gosi and the plural of Gosi if more if one Gosi meets another Gosi you have to Dikosi so that's important to know for history and each village has a little meeting spot usually under a tree and that's called the Gotsla and it's where the Gossi would meet with everyone and, you know, air out grievances, figure out, um, you know, how things should be ran, basically. And like I said, all of that still applies today. All of the major tribes in the area still have their Gossi, they still have the Kodla, and so on and so forth, but just keep that in mind. Flash forward to the 1800s, and so much is happening in this corner of Africa, so much. Um, the tribes all throughout this area get shuffled about for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, Shaka Zulu came to power, the Zulu tribe down here in South Africa, and the Zulu were an incredibly violent culture. It was a join us or die kind of situation. So lots of people were being forced out of their homes and fleeing into this area. There were the Ndebele people in what's now Zimbabwe, who actually came in and attacked a lot of Tswana villages and uh, created basically like wars, but the, the Bele were pushed out and it sort of led to the downfall of the, the Bele, like, superiority. I cannot think of like the words I want to say tonight. The, the Ndebele um, power in the area here. And then there were the um, Nama people who were getting pushed out of Namibia because this area was being taken over by Germany. They were committing some really horrible, horrible acts upon the Nama, so they were fleeing into the area here. Um, there's still quite a big Nama population today. Um, I talked about that in my Namibia video. And then there were the Boers who were um, Afrikaner people who were descendants from Dutch migrants who were, you know, born in this area, um, spoke their own language, like their own kind of dialect of Dutch called Afrikaans, um, who started to move into the area as well to set up like farms and stuff like that. And the various tribes here were not very appreciative of that. And the, um, their big ally in their corner was Great Britain. Because Great Britain pretty much had dominance over the southern area of Africa here. And of course they wanted more. Um, the British did not like the Germans being over here, and they did not appreciate how the Boers were basically ignoring all their rules and doing whatever they wanted. So the Kosi of the various tribes, um, I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, the Kosi, some of the tribes asked Britain for help and the British were very happy to oblige. And they started to come in to defend the people here slash convert them to Christianity. That started in about the 1850s when the various missionaries came in, the most famous of which was David Livingston, I presume. And then once the Scramble for Africa event occurred, um, Britain snatched up this area over here before Germany could before the Dutch could uh, assert any influence in the area. And it never became a colony, it just remained a protectorate, and it was called Bechuana Land. And nearby over here was the area that would soon become known as Rhodesia, because it was under the control of a man named Cecil Rhodes. And he wanted to build a big old railroad coming from, who was it, Johannesburg? Or Cape Town? some big city in South Africa all the way up to Cairo and so he wanted it to go through this land, the Bechuana land and um, 
a lot of people in the area believed that he wanted control of this land, not just to build a railroad, just because just he wanted to control the land. And, um, you know, he was not a very kind person. So three of the most important Gossi actually went to London to um, ask personally, like, we can't have this man in charge of our country, you know. It's a very big event. Um, I think in this book there's the statue of them that you'll see in there. And they came to an agreement. They let him build a railroad through here, the, you know, the road you can still kind of see through there. Uh, but he was not allowed to take over Bechuana land, which, so it was a success for the most part. And they kept their independence. And Britain really relied on the Kosi for a lot of um, management in the area. I mean, they had, it's the like 1920s at this point, a lot is going on in all their colonies and all around the world. So they were really relying on the tribal leaders to sort of run the show here in the area. And they started to grant them more and more power to the point where they set up like advisory councils of all the Degosi. And the most prominent one was named Chiketi Kama. Now Chiketi Kama was in charge of the Banguato people. And he was actually the regent the true Gosi was Tseritsi Kama, uh, but he came into power at age four, so Shaketi Kama became his regent. And he really, really pushed for um, not quite independence, not yet at this point, but more um, power and, and dominance and control over their land, um, less British influence, so to say. And um, once Tsuritsi Kama came of age, he actually traveled to Great Britain to study law. So he left Chiketi Kama, I think it was his uncle, in charge of the tribe so he could get a law degree and then come back and be the Gosi, be the, the king of Anguato. While he was there, he met a woman named Ruth Williams. Um, she was white, he was black, they fell in love, and they got married. And that really caused an uproar down here. Um, in South Africa, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if in Great Britain, and probably not, in South Africa that was very illegal. You know, whites could not marry blacks. Um, the apartheid was in full swing at this point. It was like the ball was rolling. So um, cultures weren't allowed to mix. They were separated into different areas all throughout South Africa. So... Um, you know, that was a shock to, like, the, the British and black South Africans. In what's now Botswana, it was a shock because they were doing their best to get rid of the British influence because they did not want apartheid happening in their country. The big to-do at that point was the British wanted to split the power 50-50 between blacks and whites, even though the whites were just 10% of the population, they wanted them to control 50% of the power. So there was that big power struggle happening at the time. So the fact that one of the most powerful Kosi married a white woman was like shocking. So the British told him that you cannot be in Botswana or Botswana. You cannot be here if you're married to a white woman. They, he basically lived in exile and was forced to move back to Great Britain. So he renounced his title as Kosi so he could come back with his wife to his homeland as a private citizen and campaign for the rights of the Botswana. The Botswana is what people from Botswana are called, by the way. And all of that work paid off. In September 30th, 1966, Botswana became an independent nation and the first president to be elected was da -da -da -da, Siritsi Kama. Um, which is awesome. What a comeback story. Um, he really ushered in an economic boom, um, him and his vice president, who was later elected president once his terms ended. It was around this time when the um, diamond industry started to really take off. The, you know, the diamond mines were being uncovered and mined and sold to the De Beers company and even like processed in Botswana. So a whole big diamond industry started to boom, really boosted the economy of Botswana. I mean, at independence, it was very underdeveloped. Like I said, it was never a colony, so they never had paved roads or 
um, like, you know, British schools or hospitals, any kind of British building like that, like Western European style architecture or city planning. So they really took that econ economic boom and ran with it. And it became one of the most economically prosperous countries in the world. Um, the quality of life just shot up and they built some gorgeous skyscrapers and really focused on tourism so they could preserve all of the wonderful wildlife in their country as topple. And um, that's essentially where Botswana is today. Very highly developed. Um, very, you know, in a lot of African countries when they gain their independence, you wind up with coups or a military leader deciding he's going to go like full one party, socialist, communist, what have you, dictatorial government. That's never happened in Botswana. Their government has stayed very, very strong. There have been quite a few instances in Botswana's history. Um, three of them just, I mean, it's nothing like the country was overthrown, blah, blah, blah nothing like that. Um, but Botswana was hit very, very hard by the AIDS crisis. It is the second most infected country after, um, oh, I almost said Swaziland, after Eswatini. Um, but, but, I know it's awful, I know, it's, it's worrisome, right? But, um, Botswana has done a lot, a lot, lots, lots in terms of, um, care and, um, treatments and research and things like that for HIV and AIDS so that people who do test positive for either HIV or AIDS can still have a high quality of life, can still live their lives normally. It's, um, you know, they're, they're really spearheading the technical advances in the care of HIV and AIDS. Um, also, the Sun people, like I said, the Sun, are still living here. And, um, at one point, my cat's snoring, okay, at, <laughs> let me wake him up, okay, I said to wake up the cat. Um, the president at the time, his name is Festus Moge, started implementing, um, some plans that would have removed the sun from their land, um, to make it, like, national park and all of that, and the sun very much protested, and, um, went as far as, like, going to the government threatening lawsuits. It was a huge legal uh, to-do, basically, but the San won out. They got to keep their land. There are uh, many San people who have been displaced due to government planning and have had to live on basically on reservations, but um, for the most part, the San are slowly but surely winning their rights back, um, just agreeing to, you know, help preserve the national park area while they can still continue living the way that they've been living for hundreds of thousands of years, you know. Um, lastly, kind of darkly, um, a 14-year-old girl named Segametsi Mokomotsi was um, kidnapped and killed, sadly. Um, she was selling oranges by the road, and she disappeared. And when she was found, there were body parts missing, so people figure, you know, that she was used for... Um, you know, selling her body parts for black magic, basically, and it was a huge investigation. Um, there were people who were caught and arrested, but they were never charged, they were pardoned. So people are like, well, it's a government conspiracy, the government has a say in witchcraft, and there were big riots, um, some of which the, the police did not handle properly, and people were killed and injured during those riots, and no one has ever been prosecuted for her murder. It still remains unsolved to this day. Very mysterious, but um, that's basically where Botswana is today. Like I said, nothing as earth-shaking as the government was overthrown and what have you. Uh, but yeah, it's a really interesting country in my opinion. I want to show you some pictures. Can you hear Rooster out there? Rooster's excited too. Excuse me, it's Hoppel. Let me move this over so we can look at some pictures of Botswana. Let's see what we got. Look at this. This is like my dream, right? Big elephant splashing in the delta. All the tourists get to watch. We've got um, someone voting for parliament, it looks like there. A big old hippo. <laughs> it's so cute. I mean, they are highly dangerous, but I think they're cute. 
Oh, some gorgeous giraffes. It's just a beautiful place for wildlife. Here's another map of Botswana in the area. Here's the coat of arms and basically like every fact I've read about Botswana had to mention that the national motto is Pula. The name of their currency is the Pula and it means rain. Like that's how important rain is to the culture. The Akavango Delta, isn't that beautiful? All marshy and wet, full of life. Got a big old baobab tree. Beautiful trees, I think. Some sweet little meerkats there. Oh, I love it. The baby elephants. I love elephants so much. And there's Count Barone. What a gorgeous picture of this guy there, too. We've got some San people. Looks like they're starting a fire here. There's, um, is that Shaka? No, that's just a warrior. A Zulu warrior. I was going to say, is that Shaka? But it's not. This is Robert Moffat. He was, uh, like the main missionary in Bechuana land. He actually translated the Bible into, um, Setswana for the people who lived here. Here, um, in Cecil Rhodes, being Cecil Rhodes, look at the map back here. And here's the three de Cossi monument, the three men who went to Great Britain to put a stop to Cecil Rhodes. Here is Siritsi Kama, and here's the current president, it's Mukwisi Masisi. Here he is being sworn in in 2019. Let's see what else we have, the parliament building. But the um, the high court, you can see justice up there. The military, it says it has never fought in a war. Some examples of Pula. There's Ian Kama, who is Saritsi Kama's son. He was also president. Diamond mining. Big open pit mines. Chunks of kimberlite used to wear down diamonds. Some sweet cattle. <laughs> like I said, a big cattle ranching culture. Some beautiful cheetahs. I love cheetahs. The airport. It says it's, you can see all the English. It's the majority language spoken there, even though there are so many languages spoken in Botswana. Solar power out in the Kalahari. It's so bright and sunny, may as well. Um, is this a, there's so many different types of antelope. Is it like a kudu? No, a kudu have big old antlers. Maybe it's a, like a, what's it called? A gem box? No, no gem boxer. Anyway, I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, what a great sign. Save the animals before they are gone. Rhino, elephant, lion, pangolin. Yes, help the pangolins, please. They really need protection. Some sweet zebras. Looks like they're out on the salt pan there. White rhinos. Big old rhinos. Was it in this book I was reading that black rhinos, like, because they're not actually black, but um, the um, Afrikaner word, the Afrikaans word for the rhino sounded like black, so the English thought they were saying black rhino. Anyway, <laughs> I like stories like that. Aww. Simba and Nala. I can feel the love tonight. <laughs> Aww. Some wonderful faces there. Very smiley, happy. Looks like they're um, harvesting back there. Maybe some um, millets? Maybe? I'm not sure. Something there. Some more wonderful faces. Um. I think I was talking about resettlement villages for the Son. You can see this house is made out of sticks with mud patched into the gaps. And we're working hard in school. What else do we have? Playing pool. <laughs> Having fun. Oh, now these are fantastic faces. Oh, they're so sweet. <laughs> they're Oh, I was going to say, who's your favorite? They're all my favorite. These are wonderful little smiles. Here's a Rondeville house. 
very common type of home in Southern Africa. Oh my gosh, more wonderful faces. Look at these two. <laughs> Look at them. They are posing. This one's like, please save me from my crazy brothers. <laughs> I think she's laughing. <laughs> That's a great picture of the little family there. I love that. It's so cute. <laughs> Collecting some water there. Helping out with chores. Really old missionary church from back in the, the missionary era and keeping ourselves safe from COVID and this is at the University of Botswana it says it looks like it's a math class wearing their church uniform cozy hat there that looks warm some traditional dancing here it says it's a hunting dance the San people Here's some of the Tsodilo Hills rock art. So, so beautiful. Look at the giraffes. Awesome. And here is a mosque also. Beautiful blue day, huh? Let's listen to the radio. Showing the nice day. Oh my goodness, look at this. She's got so much. Th look, at, look at those yams. <laughs> Another wonderful face. Everyone in this book has such fantastic smiles. Oh my gosh, there's some more. Let's see. <laughs> so cute. Haven't seen a bad smile yet. Look at this. Um, old handmade. Um, it's a segaba. This looks like a violin. And some of the rattles that they wear while they dance. And some beautiful, beautiful baskets. So pretty. This there's a museum here. Or no, it's just a shop. Yeah, it's a tourist shop. You can buy some handmade trinkets. Oh, it looks like we're grinding up some grinding up something. <laughs> to make flour probably. Playing some jump rope. I always like to be the person holding the rope because being in the middle was too much pressure. I was really bad at jump rope, but I was always willing to hold the rope for people. <laughs> it's an important part of the playground. Here's Karabosi Banda and Isaac Makwala in the Rio games doing the um, relay. Yeah, relay. And playing some soccer professionally and at home outside. Oh wow, it's a party. Playing some instruments. Ooh, it's a real big party now. You can see some Herero women, also from um, Namibia. You can see their traditional clothes there. Oh, look at that outfit. It's a dance group called Shikakao. That looks awesome. <laughs> Another fantastic face, my goodness. <laughs> we got some peanuts. And we've got some Wopani worms. So a lot of people uh, roast these little worms and eat them like potato chips. And doesn't this look delicious? You got your meat. Potatoes? Is that what that is? It's sorghum, millet, and some greens. Can't go wrong with that kind of dish. And, hmm, Kobe some sorghum and beans and ginger beer I don't like ginger I don't like beer so I'll pass on that and there's a big big map of Botswana you can see the big Kalahari desert and all the areas in between all right so that's going to be it for tonight like I said before I do have some more videos about Botswana coming up for you this week so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. Look at this smile too. Fantastic smiles in this book. <laughs> Have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.